afternoon, everybody. I thought I would say hello on a holiday Monday because I had a little bit of time and I had a first thought while I was staying home with my kids <laughs> for three days. And I thought it might be nice to start with some uh, tips and tricks about um, cleaning and dealing with it. So recently, the thing that's hit me most about working with uh, neurospicy people, neurodiverse in any way, um, whether they self identify as a particular neurotype or neuro uh, difference or have a diagnosis or somewhere in the middle or whatever. Um, I'm just glad we're talking about different brain types at all, right? The fact that there's just different personalities, there's different ways we learn things. And the vast majority of teaching and or instructing or parenting or whatever you want to call it, because it's just whoever's the person doing at, right? It's that's the problem. It's defined by the person who's doing <laughs> like at teaching is done at somebody. I'm like, well, why don't we talk about the learner? Why don't we talk about the kid? Why don't we talk? Why isn't it childing? Why isn't it studenting? Right. We, we verb the instructor because there are people who, you know, are hired or whatever or whatever. Right. Because <laughs> capitalism. Um, so <laughs> I was thinking, wait, we do that totally within the medical community. And, um, Hi, my name is Maria. Uh, I am not part of the medical community, but I did uh, join into the medical community for 20 years. I was a birth doula and a lactation educator and supporter. Um, I worked as a quote unquote LC um, in, I'm not going to put lower letters on everything right now. And then I trained as a certified counselor and uh, practice as a mental health provider. And I'm not, uh, I'm not doing any medical advice. I'm not doing any psychotherapy uh, advice, but I am chatting up here with people because I want there to be a resource for all of the stuff I've had in my head for like 20 years, um, uh, 30 years, and my own journey of uh, neurodiversity and mine being completely different even than other people. So like, I don't even see myself represented yet. And that's kind of the problem is that all of these things, including names for diagnosis and stuff. And if you are assigned female at birth or um, uh, female present, um, then in our culture, if you get medical care, you are defined by like how your part isn't working, right? So I was talking about how, um, in birth, it's an incompetent cervix, but I've never heard it called an incompetent prostate. No, it's erectile dysfunction or it's, you know, no, why, why, yeah, it's still dysfunction. Yeah, it's still got these horrible terms on it, but you're parted out, literally turned into parts. And the names for support and things for, um, neurodiversity. There are now great TikTok creators, great uh, YouTube creators, lots of shorts people and stuff like that, right? Who are coming out and saying things from their own perspective. They're going, hey, this is what I do. This is how I clean. This is how I get it done. And from an ADHD or uh, neurodiverse, autism, Audi, those who identify still as Aspies, um, any of those, you know, neurodiversities, it's like, hey, we're starting to get their own words for their own communities and things. But it's kind of nice as both a neurodiverse person myself, and also as someone who has literally spent like 30 years thinking about the language and putting it together for other people. I'm like, wait a minute, let's collect this and bring it to people in a little bit more uh of a collection, right? Nothing, go watch the, watch the TikToks for five, five minutes, 30 seconds. That may be more like your, it might be the right length of time for you, go for it. <laughs> but um, I thought I'd get some of the neuro spicy hacks. Um, uh, oh yeah, uh, clickbait um, for people who haven't thought about it that way and change the language. Just to start, the idea here is to just get that language of this is inside out facing out, 
right? Rather than, so I watched a YouTube uh, um, video, another one of these, where someone had, you know, oppositional de defiance in kids or extreme, you know, uh, dysphoria and things like that. It's not how the person sees it. Like you can't even identify it in you because it's how a doctor would diagnose it in you. Oh my gosh, Snipe Chan, thank you so much for sharing. Um, borderline personality disorders or, and I'm just gonna say for those who are self-identify or who aren't diagnosed or don't want to be, um, that I'm gonna go with like borderline personality type responses, okay? So it sounds like I'm adding a lot of words and jargon, but for the first little while until, uh, it's the it's the alphabet thing, right? Um, I now use Q plus for all the alphabet of queer because queer is now a word that's fairly positive in my world. Um, we had to use LGBTQA to A because people didn't know what we were talking about for a while and then we can shorten it back down. So I'm gonna work with the longer words so that people can be comfortable. And right now, I'm not gonna diagnose anybody. I'm not gonna tell somebody they're a narcissist or that they have borderline. But if you identify, or if someone in your world identifies as borderline personality, that is one that I have really been interested in lately. Uh, it's not an identi identity for me. So I'm sharing it as a counselor uh, and as a, a former doula and as a professor and general nerd about mental health and stuff like that. I like ND plus that's become my new word for like neurospicy, neurodiverse and all it like, and I stole it from Q plus. Right. Um, and if, you know, it's better, we got to have some good initials on our side. So the, for borderline type personality things, you know, like whatever that representation is, it is especially one that is outside at people right? It's, and the previous words that were used for it, it's really about like how you'll see hysterical, crazy women with it, mostly in the medical community. And that's good for the first little bit, because <laughs> we got to have doctors who can find these things. We, we kind of eh, have to have the DMV5 and stuff like that for a while. But but I tell people all the time, you don't have to have ADHD to look in a book with resources about ADHD because maybe it just has some executive function support. You don't need to have autism to find something about sensory support, but it might be in a book that's called autism. And borderline for me is I... I don't think of the borderline as like you're on the edge, which is the, what it's become, right? Is that the discourse? That's what I hear, right? People on the edge of being nuts. No, no. I literally, the metaphor that I worked with and the one that just like hit me like a wall, you will see the trees behind me. Everything um, is trees. I, yeah, I, I'm the person who, who has the irritating tree of life all over the place. Sorry. I know it's so overdone, but hey, there's a reason why. It's super cool, right? And for uh, borderline type stuff and other diversities, I often find that it's like, how did it happen that way? How did that, is that genetic? Is that training? And I call it training, meaning like, how the world trained you to be. And one of the things that I really see in borderline personality types is um, being trimmed, being pruned into two. Uh, most people have fight or flight as their mainstream like reactions to fear, anxiety, worry things. Those are our old crocodile brains um, there are four parts to your brain and I'm going to talk about them all the time on this channel. And I go, there is your words brain. There is your feeling brain. There's your crocodile snap at things brain. And then there's literally like your brain stem, the I feel cold or I feel shivers or whatever, our actual nervous system, right? And what happens in borderline is usually abuse 
or trauma or uh, just interaction with people. Like even if it's not meant to be negative, it's just lack of something. It doesn't necessarily mean anybody has to be, you know, the really bad stuff. It could just be a world that makes you have to split into two. And so instead of being fight or flight, because you can't do those things, often what the brain does is it turns and it goes, okay, I'm going to do these two things. And they're called fawn or failure because you're not allowed to run away or fight back. And so to me, it's like a tree that has been pruned around a power line or something, you know, have you ever seen like Y-shaped trees or like things that grow through fences or whatever? The tree has to live, but the thing goes around and the thing that goes around in some neurodiversities and what we call personality disorders or personality difficulties, as I like to call them, um, is that you had to split yourself in two to stay safe. And so you start to fawn, which means hey, I'll say the nice things. Thanks so much. Really appreciate that. That's so kind. That's great. That's wonderful. That's, oh yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, that's, oh yeah, no, huh? Dad. Because you had to, to protect yourself from not being able to run or yell back. And then when you can, when you can finally let go of that and rest, when another person would rest with anxiety or crying or falling apart, if it's still not safe, what you have to do is fail. And you either fail on the inside by going, I'm useless, I can't do it, I'm not there, I can't get her done. Or you fail and push that out and you go, you wore that shirt? <laughs> and you really, people really do hurt. They really do hurt and they push it out. And that's, I think that's why it's gotten a really bad rep is because we see the worst circumstances, right? Of people who are like, um, like it's good that we're ripping apart the worst I'm gonna call them mean girls in the world or mean guys in the world. But um, that's not a day-to-day -day experience of somebody who's like generally a nice person, generally a caring one. Um, the vast majority of people have had to keep them safe. So I will start with my usual sort of disclaimer here, which is that um, no, not medical advice, not mental health advice. This isn't psychotherapy. This is nothing at all. It is information. It is education. Um, but I will say that everything I do is evidence-based. Um, I don't just talk. I, If I say something, I've probably read about it in PubMed like 7,000 times because I used to be called Mrs. Google before Google existed by my uh, colleagues. <laughs> And I'm a nerd who remembers like literally everything and then looks it up and reads it. And I'm also an empath. I identify as a reader of people's, you know, like when their faces go by, I ask them, does it feel like this kind of thing? And so it's really normal for me to go, uh, that's from your perspective. And I really think that a lot of these, any kind of stuff, just taking care of yourself hacks, let's call them hacks. Like I'm just using the, the stupid world is that, um, that this is gonna be my standard disclaimer at the beginning of everything. Your bad habits, your horrible coping strategies, even your addictions are good things. Sorry, what? Yeah, they're good because they are your body, your brain, your thinking brain, your emotional brain, and your crocodile brain reaching out for help. They're reaching out for love, care, connection, comfort. That's a good idea. You know what's bad about them? Heroin. Alcohol. Reaching out to eat 40 donuts reaching out to get the marijuana or the thing. That's not the problem. It's the backlash. It's the circle where it comes back. So I'm going to say the reaching out is good. The addiction is bad. The medications, the things, the stuff. And that could be with anything. You could use... You could use heroin well. I mean, not many people can, but you know what I mean? Like you could totally, I know people who are not addicted to marijuana. Yep, 
I'm in a country and in a province and an area where it's perfectly legal and you can buy it like alcohol. So I'm going to talk like that. If you're listening in another jurisdiction, that might be a little weird. Um, but you might use harder drugs or something really well, but you have an addiction to food. That was my journey. I'm a binge eater. Is that addiction as bad as heroin? Well, maybe not. But is the internal shit happening to me? The bad coping? Yeah. And it's, it's real that these coping strategies were there to protect you. When you did something bad, when you got a bad habit, you did it to protect yourself. That is good. But that thing no longer protects you once you have anxiety or relationships that go sour because you don't have communication or an addiction that derails your life. So go back and say, but the wanting the connection was good. It just isn't the thing. The coping strategy ended up being not helpful. But having a bad habit protected me. So good. Let's protect ourselves. And then let's find something else. And as a counselor, when I, when I was a counselor previously, um, I'm not practicing at the moment, but what I used to tell people is do not take your coping strategy away. What? Yeah, unless you're at the point where I, we need to call somebody and, and deal with something very large, but just like if you're safe and dealing, um, then don't take away your coping strategy until we figure out what you're coping with. <laughs> Change, find a new coping strategy, find new help, and then take the coping strategy away. Don't remove the net that is keeping you safe, no matter how bad that net is, before we put on a new seatbelt, before we get new airbags. <laughs> Don't jump out of the car kind of thing. So I, I want to start with something light so that we can have some fun, so that we can have some like, just get at something, but totally thank you for sharing a larger thing to start and that idea that the reason we're doing this is because we want to frame our language from us inside and not out and that anything any tool could be used well any addiction could be a good coping strategy any addiction could be a bad one you could destroy your life with something small just as much as you can destroy your life with something big. Yeah, they're, they're larger ammunition as it were, but you can hurt yourself with a small knife just as much as you can hurt yourself with a large one. And yeah, I've got trigger warnings on everything because I'm not gonna stop myself uh, from talking about some things. I'm gonna definitely on the really biggest stuff, but do always, that's my other disclaimer, always, always, always take care of yourself. Just step away, just step back, just turn it off. Just do the thing, just go to your other coping strategies, find a grounding strategy. If I ever talk about something and it feels weird, walk away, D yell at me, do whatever. It's all good, okay? What it feels like from the inside is that you're at a one out of 10 pain level from emotional pain, um, similar to when you've lost a loved one. Yeah. I'm still cool. <laughs> My mom says I'm cool. And I love that, actually. We were talking about, like, being not cool cool. Like, um, you know, I'm so not cool, I'm cool. Which is actually what made me start this channel, basically. The idea that, uh, especially young female presenting people, are, like, gathering back the, your bullying can't touch me. Like, oh, you're so cool. I'm cool. Yeah, I am. Total dark. Thanks. And it's like, poof, the magic's gone. And that works for, <clears throat> it doesn't work easily, but it works for narcissists too. We'll get to that in a different one. But it also works for your internal processing of yourself and framing this as, hey, I, I'm, I'm good with being a nerd. I, I, I always joke, the geeks shall inherit the earth. 
<laughs> right? Like we started to turn the world. And I'm literally the age right now where I am the year. I was born the year that, um, like the Star Wars year, the Load Runner year, the the year that Gen X to to uh, uh, is supposed to have switched over, kind of thing. Like I'm in that micro generation. I was literally like 18, 19. I was given an email the day I came to university and did not have one before. Right, like it was to the minute, and I view, and there's lots of people of different experiences depending on what age they go to school and stuff, right? So that year is is sort of spread out, but I really do feel like I'm one of those ones that's like right on the line. And now that I'm old, and I'm older than I look, and that's one of the things I'm going to address on this channel is why do I have no wrinkles when I'm nearly that old? Well, um, because of the genetic crazy disorder like joint issues that I have also means that I don't have wrinkles I don't think I have a filter on do I did it automatically filter me if it did these are real skin texture and real I don't I, I specifically didn't put on makeup for this I might at some point but when I've got it on but I specifically went N -n -n. um <laughs> but I'm now the boomer I, I'm not a boomer but I'm a boomer when it comes to some of my privilege and all of the young people, the, the younger millennials and the, the, the um, uh, Gen Y and are coming along and it's like, they're becoming young adults and stuff. And I'm like, wait, I can protect them because when they come up to an old adult, who's a professor or something, they're not going to get the old guard. And it's kind of nice. I'm not doing all the change. I'm not young enough anymore to do the change, but like I can stand here and be like, actually, I'm the professor that's going to take that information or I'm the counsel who's going to talk to you that way or I'm going to say you have better language than I do kind of thing. So that's why I'm kind of doing it. I'm like, I can actually represent for other people or sorry, with other people, help them represent themselves. So um, that is, those are my two, two things. Okay. Be nice, stay human. Um, here, everybody's welcome. And I will, yeah, I will just delete. Why do I do that when it's supposed to be like all nice? Yeah, because sometimes it's not the right time. If somebody's triggered, if something's bad for the wrong time, sometimes you need to take a break. And I'm a big fan of the pause. If you can't take time, then you can't human together. So um, it's not always about what you said or what I have to delete, or it's not the topic, it's not the phrases. Sometimes just the timing of like, everybody do it. Exactly, Snipe Chan. Yeah, I think a lot of social change is going to happen as the oldest group retires. The oldest group, not the oldest group, the oldest, oldest group, like people who are like 90, they're awesome. Cause they're like, oh yeah, you should just like, you should just feed your baby and you should just like, you should just do the thing. And like, we just, we just stayed at home and you know, we did the thing and then like do whatever, do, you know, like, cause they came post depression. It's the people after them. <laughs> my, my, uh, a great grandma in my extended family was like 95 when I had my first kid. And that was 20 years ago, mind. But that, I literally was like, how am I going to feed this baby in front of you? And how am I going to like, you know, be at your house with a baby that might need to be walked or napped? What are you going to think of me carrying my baby or, or putting it down or whatever? And you know what? Great grandma came and sat next to me and was like, oh, it's so nice to just see people getting back to just doing whatever. Because the young people, the young people were so strict. And, what, and I'm like, you're talking about 70 year olds the young people she was talking about are we're boomers and i when the phrase okay boomer came around i was like oh my god great grandma was the first person that went okay boomer <laughs> oh yes it's awesome it's perfect i'm like yes please do that so um same thing i think we're at a at, at what i call the old guard um yeah there's a group that is is going to become the whatever you say, grandpa, right? And it's just happening. And that there's this uh, generation of hopefully people my age-ish who are coming along going, 
No good. The young people are fine. Carry on. Car no. Oh, you you have problem. No, actually, the older people are. No, you're fine. Carry on. Just yeah. No, you're you're being a jerk. They're they they've yeah mm -hmm, they're fine. Go ahead. Carry on. Go ahead. Um. <laughs> yeah, the me generation for sure. The people work hard. I won't even get started on work hard. I'll do that another time. Um, so I thought, like I said, I'd start with a language change that was on something kind of light and fun, <laughs> which is how to clean up. And it just gets us started with that language change. And like I said, I'm, um, I've been doing all this work uh, behind the scenes, but my YouTube channel is brand new. So I'm trying to get a lot of this stuff out here so that it can be rewatched. So I'm going to have only a few people on my lives right now and stuff like that. But hey, I've been doing this in workshops for paid clients. I've been doing it, but I had this unique opportunity that now that I'm, I don't have to do that. I'm in a lucky, lucky privileged position where I'm going to use, my, I'm going to share my privilege. I'm going to sit here in my nice office and share my privilege because that's what's good when privilege is, it's been a privilege or it is a privilege, as opposed to you don't know your privilege. They can both be good, right? Let's switch it to, I'm going to give you some of my privilege for a second. And when it comes to gathering information, one of the things that I love sharing the most was actually like these things that just broke through the mindset of people. And my favorite thing um, was neurodiversity for cleaning, clutter, stuff like that. I did home org for a while as a postpartum doula. I would just end up naturally doing that. And I didn't realize I was doing it neuro spicy. I was doing it neurodiverse for a while because I was just like, well, that's how I talk to anybody. I have a kid who has autism. I have a kid who's diagnosed with ADHD. Um, and I have two kids who are diagnosed with sensory processing disorder. Um, sensitivity to textures and touch, but it's also part of the brain and sound, misophonia. We're, we deal with everything. And then I have two, what I'll call bonus kids. Um, they ain't mine. They just lovely people. I have gotten to share part of the, the adventure near. And uh, the bonus kids, one uh, struggles with a um, uh I want to give this sort of a generalized thing, right? Because my kids have been asked about sharing their diagnoses, but an anxiety disorder, let's say that, let's say that in general, right? Because I think a lot of disorders, a lot of difficulties are anxiety. <laughs> I mean, there are other things too, but like uh, when kids, you know, certain parts of ADHD, certain parts of OCD, certain parts of defiance, I think are, are really like unchecked or untalked about anxiety. I'm amazed how much trauma, PTSD, a lot of it is like, I'm gonna get squished if I say this thing out loud, right? So, I mean, and how often do teachers and people and stuff and things let kids say stuff out loud? Again, another topic that I will, <laughs> I'm gonna talk about teachers, not because I don't love them, but, but because some of them are trained to say certain things. Uh, rock in a hard place, professions, I call them. Um, nurses and teachers and parents are often rock and hard place, right? So, but a lot of these things I got from kids, I have had the pleasure of working with um, neurodiverse kids in counseling. And I am a, and I was a functional counselor. I chose not to do psychotherapy, um, just out of partly not wanting to hold on to the insurance and the stuff and the things uh, because it's expensive. And so I could make things available cheaper. And because I think there are great therapists out there doing that already. And I don't think there was anybody who was like, okay, and now that you've spent the time, you know, working on that thought inside of you, what are you going to do day to day with agency? Like what skills and tools do you have? to do. And unfortunately, the word coaching and all of that has just been totally destroyed. <laughs> Life coach. Um, so functional counseling is the word I'm left with. In your jurisdiction, 
those could have different meanings and be different people and uh, dietitians and nutritionists could be perfectly with it people both or one of them could be a charlatan right so your your mileage may, the mileage may vary um but luckily around here i can be a certified counselor and that means something it just means i don't do uh psychotherapy specifically but i have all the skills of you know up to and including but i i love the other stuff washing dishes well so that's what i put up do your dishes twice okay so we're going to start with the main theme, regardless of what we talk about, of the actual hacks. I want to do the, I work with CBT a lot, cognitive behavioral techniques or therapies. And here's the thing. If you have done some CBT, if anybody out there has, and you hate it, that's because it's done really badly. I have heard so many people come up and go, CBT was crap. And I'm like, yes, it is because they do it. Like it's like book learning. It's like learning biology by being forced to study papers versus like going out and looking into microscopes. There's a new microscope channel that I just love. And I'm like, little things. <laughs> um, so I wanted to start with, with a brain change. So I call CBT the idea of my favorite parts of it are catch your thoughts, shoo, make sure they go by. First is just seeing that they happen, right? Because you'd be amazed how many things people can't separate what their word mind actually believes versus what their emotional brain, which only works in pictures and memes <laughs> and like metaphors and things you heard in high school and things your mother-in-law said, how often it has to throw things forward to the front and go, and you have to catch it and go, yep, I heard you. Rather than, oh my God, I think that, I believe that, right? And a lot of anxiety, a lot of getting stuff done, a lot of stuckness. Um, this, this topic came out of my own uh, being stuck for about four days recently. Um, was like, I'm not faking it. I like doing stuff. I am not faking it when I can't start a task. When I'm stuck and I cannot start a task, it is not procrastination. Procrastination is real. It's not something you're doing. It is a protective feature. It's you trying to protect yourself something. Is that protection helping? Maybe not. Maybe it's making it worse. Sometimes it's what I call a self-fulfilling prophecy. <laughs> but I'm not going to be negative about the fact that it's happening because I'm coping with something. And I saw a lovely meme about do your dishes twice. And recently what I've been using for people, what I've been saying over and over to my kids and my students and my clients and everything is anything worth doing is worth doing. Finish it with me. It's not what you think badly. My procrastination is usually perfection. Yep. I do it. I don't do it. Because my brain says, you know how to finish it perfectly. You know exactly how to get an A plus on this. So why don't you do it all? Why can't you do it all? Why can't you have to do it all tomorrow? Because you should be able to do it. Well, now it's two o'clock. So how are you going to get it all done? But why don't you just do some? Can't. I'm stuck. Can't do it. Nope. Nope, nope, nope. Okay, well, now it's three hours later. Now you could never do all of it. You're right. So I shouldn't even start. What? <sighs> What can I do to make things better for myself? But how can I make it so that I can do it worse? <laughs> what? Yeah, I love paradox theory. I love paradoxes in, in therapies. I love the idea of going, I'm going to make this better for what I need by 
doing it worse looking out there. Because I'm not being judged for a lot of the things I think I'm being judged for. No one's in your house seeing it. Nobody, right? Like, ex but we have all of these people that we carry around in our head. I, I'm going to call them the mother-in-laws, but you may love your mother-in-law. It might be your grandmother. It might be your, your lady at work. It might be your uh, dad. It might be, it could be anybody, right? But um, the person who, right, you can hear the voice of. What can you do to make it better for yourself, but do it worse? So wash your dishes twice. If you throw things in the dishwasher and you throw them in badly and then they don't get clean because one was sitting on top of the other, why can't you run the dishwasher again? Just put the ones that didn't get washed back in. It's not a very good dishwasher. Put them back in. Put in some more. Keep going. What's the rule that says one dishwashing has to be perfect? And that's where perfectionism and procrastination comes from. That's one of the loops that is really common to a lot of ND plus people is I got to do it right the first time. My child with autism, and he's now old enough that I've asked him whether I can share. So stories that I share about my kids um, are going to be non-disclosing about them personally because I don't share their information, but I've asked consent um, for whether I can share some of their general stories without too much identifying information. And my child with autism, when he was young, when he was finally diagnosed around the age of eight, the psychometrist, the person who tests, right, the psychiatrist and the psych sociologist, the psychologist, and there's a psychometrist, the tester, the person who does the tests for it, um, was this awesome person. And I asked, like, what's up with late language? Why did this kid not talk till five? And his response was, it all of the oh oh this kid knows every word he he just won't talk until he can put the sentence together perfectly when he started to talk his sentences went from why for the the letter y for yogurt to Mommy, I was thinking about maybe having one of those things that's in the pantry that's in the blue container with the peel-off lid. You want a cookie? Because most kids would do it badly and go, cookie, mommy! <laughs> cookie! Give me cookie, mommy! At like two or whatever, right? Nope. Nope. Needed to be a full sentence. So sometimes people who aren't doing things are stuck on perfect. They're stuck on sensory. I don't have a dishwasher. Water sucks. Gloves absolutely helped a little bit. You changed your mindset to what can I, what do I use that helps me? My, I don't, when I hand wash dishes, I, so like I said, my neuro spicy is going to be generally different than a lot of uh, ones here. I identify very differently than a lot of things, but pff, cool. Um, but I do have, because of my chronic conditions, I have a lot of the same like responses or I have the reverse, like I need that. And so I'm like, oh, I know why someone would hate it. Does that make any sense? Like if you're somebody who loves one kind of input, you can kind of be like, when I get sick of this, I hate it. So sometimes us who can are high need can also understand the high uh, stress of something like that it's a, like it switches, that it's just on off. So that's where I try to come from when I'm like, actually I love swimming, but I get dry hands. I get, you can see, I actually have one finger that's like bleeding right now because they just, they crack and they bleed and that's what they do. And it's just part of, I will never have uh, finger skin that doesn't peel. Um, so when I wash dishes, like they go, like my fingers just die, right? 
Um, so what I do is I don't wash dishes in water. I use, I, I, I got a scrub daddy or a big squishy something or whatever makes it happy. I don't care if it's a, like a scrub cloth, a J cloth, you find your favorite thing and spend, you know, like go around and touch all the fabrics. Cause yeah, they're weird fabrics. Like that's real, right? Why are, why are like mainstream neurotypical ish people allowed to go like, Oh yeah, I can feel the fabric of my designer clothing, whatever. This is just like better. The Merino is really good, but you're not allowed to go, ew, this, this polyester squishy wash thing. Oh, well that's de classe, right? <clears throat> Name things that have to do with class that you don't say or have to do with class. Learning to, knowing two uh, languages, having an accent. Those things are good if you're rich, not good if you're not, right? Um, and sensory issues are totally like, I am more discerning versus you, you can't touch things. Bullshit. Touch whatever you want, get whatever you want. I don't wash in water. I literally fill a scrub daddy or uh, one of those nets I love these things. They're like cloths that are netty. Like you just fill it up with soap and it's like, it's kind of like a loofah for dishwashing, except it is flat. But you know, the stuff that you get, like the plastic fuzzy balls that are like for the shower you buy at the dollar store or whatever. It's that, except it's one big sheet. So you bundle it up and then you can dry it out. It's my favorite because it's scrubby enough like a loofah, but it dries like a cloth. Um, and I work with wet soap and sponge and I scrub everything off like I'm dry washing it. In my head, the joke I made was I'm, it's dry shampoo hand washing dishes. <laughs> I never fill the bowl with water and I run the water and then I rinse the water. I rinse everything under running water. And I tend to do it in really hot, fairly hot water so that it's like rinse and it's like steaming dry. And then I like put it to dry. Um, right. And it's like that changed everything. You know where I got my scrub daddies? I got them on Amazon used. I go into the back in the warehouse deals on Amazon <laughs> and it was open box. It was literally like, these are the same thing. They're just open box. And the claws are unfortunately, from an MLM. So I'm not going to name them because I'm no longer involved with that. Um, I don't even buy stuff from MLMs anymore because that's a whole, that actually kind of is where I came from. Uh, that's why I restarted this YouTube talking is because I actually was listening in and, and being joining a community that was for anti-multi-level marketing schemes that that especially perpetrate on women and uh, and. Uh, female presenting people, right? Who've had to like have a job. And that's a whole, whole nother pile of stuff. But the idea that people were striking back and going, hey, you're being a mean girl to us. You, you were being a bully. It's like a high school bu bully. And we're standing up on YouTube and going like, you're not allowed to bully us. You're not allowed to say those things anymore. I'm like, yay, words are changing. And so it was strange how I was like, I'm not the person to do anti-multi-level marketing. Um, because that's not my journey. But yeah, I was one. I, like just from an innoxious Canadian, didn't have to sell. I never sold it. I just got it for, I was just the stupid got it for the discount. The products actually don't suck completely. But yeah, I'm willing to go, no, actually, I'm not even going to do that anymore because it takes advantage of people. So uh, pff, buy it from Amazon. Amazon's horrible. Don't buy it from there. Okay. Buy it from your local maker. Buy it from Etsy. Buy it from Home Hardware if you're Canadian and you got their uh, home hardware near you and you're good with that. Buy it from wherever you want and wherever you can want. And remember that it's okay to buy it from China at the dollar store um, because you are poor. Because you're not causing all the problem with your choices when you don't have a, can't afford something. If you don't have enough money to make an ethical choice, that's okay. Make the choice in your head to go, yeah, I know. That doesn't mean you can't talk about it, right? I'm the person who always did that when it came to, I, uh, I have always lived in a world where Nestle is a perfectly reasonable thing to boycott. Because they are, they suck. They really do suck. Am I going to 
I was at an event where there was Nestle water and someone said, do you boycott? And I'm like, it's already purchased. I can't, I'm not telling Nestle anything by not drinking this water. I'm going to drink this water and I'm going to tell you about Nestle, <laughs> right? I'm going to do both. And some people think of that as flip-flopping or waffling or whatever. I'm the person that goes, I can't make a dent in their wallet. So I'm just going to talk to this person about it. You do you though. If that means I don't consume it, cool. But you know, we don't, people who do not have the privilege of voting with their dollars, people forget that when you're poor and I've been poor and I'm a rich privileged bitch now. And I'm also poor, depending on the time. And I, I'm some of everything and everybody's a lot of something else. And you know what I mean? Who knows? And nobody knows what anybody else is, but I'm going to share the parts I do have privilege for. So yeah, I dry shampoo my, my dishes. I, I, I just wash them with a scrub thing, rinse them off. Um, put them in the bathtub. As long as it won't clog the bathtub with food. I have seen people who have gotten a big long scrub brush just for dishes and wash them in. The, and they said, you know what? I started doing that when we were renovating or when the landlord was cleaning something. And then I just started doing my dishes in the tub because it was way easier and it just went faster and I could dump everything and scrub it because my back hurts when I stand up, but my back doesn't hurt when I sit at the edge of the bathtub or the opposite. Anything worth doing is worth doing badly or different or however the heck you want. The other one I wanted to take on, uh, I mean, I have a million of these, um, but I wanted to start with a few of them that sort of came up as my top five, I guess, was what about cleaning up? What about clutter? That is so common in neurodiversities, um, especially the header of ADHD or any other kind of hyper-focus. Ha <laughs> ha, it's not attention deficit. It's attention skills. Actually, most people with ADHD are hyper uh, attention and it's the switching. It's the executive function of switch, switching things around. So we need to rename that. Again, that's from the perspective of the other people that you have a deficit. You have no deficit. Maybe you have a deficit for switching or maybe you have way too much not switching or whatever, right? You're allowed to define that. I mean, the terms out there, it's good to go looking for it, but we can also sort of, I like that it's become the initials and we can almost ignore it and say, here's the parts that we want to take from it. Um, change it to attention regulation. Because I just don't know how to regulate it. Uh, I worked with a kid on the autism spectrum who couldn't clean his room and wanted to, and he was a preteen and we were talking about, you know, like his mom was just like, we got to clean up the whole thing. We got to do it. And his, oh, he would just shut down. And I'm the person that if you tell me I have to clean the whole damn thing, I will shut down. And I'm pretty, I'm spicy. But on a lot of these scores, I don't struggle with the same things that a lot of people do. I There are other things that I find really easy but I know what it's like to be stopped because of anxiety or chronic pain or something like that. Like I can do it. I got the head to do it, but I don't have the body to do it or something like that. So I'll have the body experience and not the brain experience, that kind of thing. But why not do it differently? Why not do it badly? Why not do it twice? And just, it hit me. Dinosaurs. Yeah, this was really, it was a young autistic boy, uh, you know, assigned male who like dinosaurs? Oh yeah. Because you know why that's a that's a um a stereotype? Cuz I mean, cuz it's awesome. Cuz dinosaurs exist. Like they do. Like they exist. They shouldn't exist. They're ridiculous. And yet they're real. <laughs> right? Like it's one of those things where you're like that shouldn't be there. Those they should not have giant fossils of giant lizards. And yet we do. <laughs> like, they're real. Like, of course I want to know all about them. A hundred years ago, only a hundred, 150 maybe? I think it's about 150 years ago. Dinosaurs have only been known for about 150. Everyone thought you were insane for thinking it was a dinosaur. Like, 
And now it's like what kids do, right? Like, so I go, this is how fast things shift in our culture. We think of things as so entrenched. And I'm like, that's literally been different than 10 years ago. Um, my mom is like that mom. Which way? What did I say? I'll have to remember what I said. Um, the, that dinos are awesome. Why shouldn't? So special interest for this kid was things like that. And I went, hey, do you like archaeology? It wasn't this kid's favorite way of doing it. But it was like, oh, yeah, no, archaeology is good. It wasn't their, like, favorite thing. But it was definitely enough of a, that's cool. We could talk about it. We could talk about archaeological digs. And this kid knew enough and stuff about it. And this kid was super sensory, too. Um, so their superpower was um, hyperacusis, um, incredible hearing. And so this kid would get shut down by sound all the time. And the first time that they came to my place, I had the uh, door open, like the window slider open, um, so that like the patio door so that we could get some fresh air and stuff. And the kid went, those people are fighting. I can't focus because those kid people are fighting. And I went to the window and I leaned out my ear and Oh, do you mean the people at the end of the parking lot who I think they're arguing, but they're fighting not at each other, but like about how to pack the car. I think they're just yelling like, oh my God, put it over. Yeah, yeah, push it down, push the thing down. Yeah, no, it's not going to fit. Take it back, take it back, move it over a little bit. And it sounded aggressive, but it wasn't an argument. It was just that kind of, and it is really, really, really normal. Um, for a uh, autistic kid um, to like not be able to parse out yet um, whether yelling is argumentative or fighting or aggressive and loud or sarcastic, right? That anger, anxiety, people who are sad versus people who are angry and stuff, really, really normal. That's something they're learning literally concretely instead of like abstractly like just picking it up right and that's normal that's perfectly reasonable for the brain to do when it's doing something else because that's how autistic brains often work they're doing something else his parents had been treating him as if he was hearing things and all of this, there was this myth over him making stuff up and like imaginary friends and stuff. And I'm like, he means the people at the parking lot. Like I can hear them too. I have hyperacusis. I can hear things a million miles away. And they went out. Sure enough, they walked around the building. And they're like, that's like 10 townhouses away. How can you hear that? I'm like, do you want me to tell you what they just said? Sensory sensitivity is real to the people who are it's happening to. It is not like I dislike this more because I've like don't want it. I don't like it. I don't. It's like being covered in Velcro and wanting to give somebody a hug. Or it's like having loud music happening while you're doing it. It is truly actually happening in the brain. Absolutely. When it's happening, it's happening. So we went, no talking while cleaning. Sounds bug you. And the mom directing, and I've been that mom. I'm not saying that mom was doing anything wrong because I was just using a neurotypical-ish kid thing, right? Oh, let's do this and let's do that and let's do this. And that's awesome. And then you have somebody say, and I had it happen to me too, where they go, what if you stopped talking? And to this day, as the mom who always wants to fix stuff and talk it through, I sometimes have to remember to shut up for my oldest kid because I'll over talk them. Dishes is like submerging my arms in acid. It is. If you're sensory sensitive and it feels like that analogy, that's really happening to you. 
And you can actually do, you can stick people into MRIs and things and get that. You can do nerve conduction studies and you can see it's true. They're not making it up. It's actually happening to them. So the first thing with CBT is the catching the thought. And the second one is going, this is really happening from the back of the brain. Is my response the best thing ever? What is what I think about it the best thing ever? But the real happening, often we get stuck because we're not allowed to have that thought. No, you don't. You're fine. Oh, you'll be okay. Whoa, thought stopping. You were trained into thought stopping and then you it protected you from people in your life or maybe teachers or maybe just the generalized society thing. It protected you from a, a horrible coach. You know, it doesn't have to be your parents. Your parents could be fabulous, right? It can be anybody. Anybody in a previous part of your life that you realize that this was normative and I had to go through a cycle to protect yourself, right? So you have to fawn and fail or you have to freeze and fight or some combination of them. Um, and people with sensory issues, when they're not believed, I was not believed for 30 years that chronic pain was happening to me. Oh, 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 yeah. Is that true? Now I understand CBT. Isn't it crap when people are like, do the book and do the thing and go to classes. And now that you've been diagnosed, you have to go through this thing. Or maybe you had to do it for your, you know, like it was part of whatever. Or you had a psychologist like sit and teach it to you. Or you had to do a thing. It, it's, it's like saying, like, I'm going to teach kindergarten kids by lecturing at them. This is red. Oh, has anyone, do you remember the Simpsons thing? I'm old, so I'm going to have Simpsons references, um, like old Simpsons references. But there's one that it's like, you know, he's doing the bubble popper and he's pushing it back and forth. And he's like that little Fisher Price thing, right? Like bubble popper. And he goes, look at the thing. Look, the see, that's actually the gravitational field is pulling them up and then centripetal force, not centripetal. He's like, and they go, can we play with it now? No, you will enjoy it on as many levels as I do. And so <laughs> he doesn't let anyone actually play. Right? And I do that with CBT. I'm like, um, you have to play. CBT is about playing it, and it's about thinking your thoughts and then catching them. And the first one is going, I remember the first time CBT made sense to me. It was that I was having a really big anxiety thing and my brain was going like over and over. I could hear it ping, like just going like, oh my gosh, that's gonna happen. It's, I can't do it. I'm not, oh my gosh, it's, it's, oh my gosh. And then I started to go, wait a minute, I'm gonna count this because I'm a musician. And my brain somehow, and I also do like babies and their heart rates, you know, when you have to do like the little, do, 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 right? And all the things I'm like, what is it? it's 160 beats a minute. Wait a minute. That means I'm thinking this thought 160 times a minute. Of course I can't deal with it. And then I realized a little bit later that like, if I, if I think about it, it wasn't as bad. I'm having this thought 160 times a second. Metacognition, that's the formal term, yeah. We call it catching your thoughts. Just catch them. It happens in medita meditation and things like that too. Um, see them go by, watch them as birds. CBT is about going, oh, look, there you are. <laughs> I like paradox, which goes on and goes, oh, look, there you are. Okay, see, yeah, mm -hmm, I got your number. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I wasn't believed for 30 years that I was in chronic pain. I was gaslit, not by my family. So people, when we do inner, when I had to do inner child work and stuff, and I was learning that, I love Imago, inner child stuff. And I love supporting people through it. And I teach it as an agency, like you do it. I don't therapize it at you. It's also the reason why I don't uh, do psychotherapy is because I don't want to do something at somebody because that's usually the problem with what they dealt with before. Someone CBT'd at you. <laughs> Maybe someone should show you how to use CBT for you. Yeah, so. It's the same stuff, but like maybe like, oh, no, no, I'll show you how to do it. Can I, can I, can I try the screwdriver? Nope, nope. You just have to watch. So 
my traumatic gaslighting came from the medical community and from well-meaning to not well-meaning teachers. Just from that systemic language from teachers, systemic language from, and the, no, you're fine. Or my favorite was, no, you can't feel that. I'm gonna have to put my um, fingers off screen. <laughs> can I can absolutely feel that and I read recently in a book about the kind of chronic pain I have and it was this article that just like I literally had to sit there for like an hour after reading it on PubMed and just going literally took me a while the kind of pain I have needs to be treated, it says in the thing, it says from these people who have advanced pain in this condition and think, you know, um, uh, I, I don't have an affirmative diagnosis. I self-identify as having um, a joint collagen disorder. I'm in the process of whether that becomes um, externally uh, diagnosed. Uh, I choose to use the word self-identify to make it so that we don't think of it as a medical diagnosis, but that doesn't mean I'm not right. And I don't mean I looked at it for 40 seconds on Google and got myself freaked out about having it. No, it's actually been 30 years. I took a university degree partly on sleep so that I could diagnose without diagnosing my own sleep conditions. So I did this like I went way over the top. I'm an overeducated farmer. I had to, I, I, in my family, if you want to ask a question, you get a university degree, that doesn't make university degrees impressive. It just makes us crazy, you know, in the good way. <laughs> and I'm going to use the word crazy. I'm also not, because I both hate it that people are treated that way, and I'm also taking it back and going, it did drive me a lot of months. Um, but that idea, when I learned about sensory processing, and I had spent 30 years with teachers and medical people and everybody going, no, you can't feel that. It's the, I never was going to say that to my kids. My inner child was screaming, oh, I'm not going to say that to my kids. But it wasn't my mom. It wasn't my dad. It wasn't my siblings. It wasn't coming from there. So you can have a perfectly non-traumatic childhood. Or you can think to yourself, but my family's fantastic. Or you can think to yourself, but nothing really bad happened. You're allowed to have a Y axis. You're allowed to, on a scale, you know, we say on a scale from, I call it hangnail to war refugee, you're allowed to know that this is here. But it is toxic positivity to be like, well, that makes it much smaller than anybody else's problems. It's your problem. You're allowed to have it. And you're allowed to have a Y axis, the up and down. You could be, I'm dealing with having a broken leg and it's okay. It's okay, like it sucks, it sucks, but like, I'm okay, I'm hobbling, it doesn't hurt that much. Or you could be like, I have a hangnail and I can no longer cook dinner. I hate everybody, I'm crying on the floor. I am at 99% red line, I'm done. It is, as I said last night to a friend, the camel that broke the straw. <laughs> Oh, one more camel. <laughs> Just throw a camel at it. It can be anything. You're allowed to have the thing that doesn't work for you. And when a sensation, especially when it's sensation-based, uh, it's really happening. Uh, what the article said was that people who have this pain condition, when it advances, need intense consistent daily pain control because similar to Huntington's and MS and other conditions like that, this is a, every single part of your body is affected by it. It's a, it can become a neurological or, or, or built in disorder all the way through. And they said the only in the article, it said the only analogy we can give as people who've never felt it, but other people have described it as bad as being 
in a full body, high speed car accident. And when someone says, where does it hurt? Those people, you can't, when you have somebody in a high speed car crash, you can't say, where does it hurt? You have to treat the entire body as in distress. Every single joint is bruised. Every single muscle might be torn. And that's the kind of pain I deal with. I regularly walk around when I'm happy and refreshing and talking to people, I can have my pain at a seven. And I can mask or present or sometimes I'm masking in a fake way and sometimes I'm presenting in a good way. And sometimes I'm like, no, I'm this happiness and this goofiness actually kind of helps it, right? Like I'd rather do that than like if I sit there, you know? So yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Just because it's not that bad compared to what? I didn't get what I needed. Your diet's not that bad, but maybe I didn't get what I needed today. It could be the same as what you got yesterday and maybe it's just not enough calories for what you did today, right? The day matters, same thing. It, the life matters, the thing it's like, you're allowed to have a Y axis. You're allowed to have an amount that says, I didn't get what I needed. And maybe that's because somebody didn't know how to do it. Maybe they were jerks. Maybe it was abuse. Maybe they just never, were taught what to say either, or didn't think of it, or, honey, I can mask, mask a 10. I, I like to, when I go to the, with chronic pain, since it's different, I only start to, to notice, not notice, but like other people can't read me in pain until I'm past 10. When, if, you, if you've ever been in the kind of pain where you hear, you wake up and you hear yourself whimpering or beyond whimpering, like you're actually going, like you're squeaking and you wake up and you're like, oh my God, my ankle, my ankle, my ankle. Like when you, you know, you sprained it or something and it's like, oh, oh, oh my God, it's throbbing now. It's throbbing. Oh my God, it's burning. It's burning. It's burning. Yeah, I can wake up like that. And that's way past. That's the only one people, like I could bask that. I've done that. I've walked out. I remember walking out of a university classroom, like literally in a fuzz in a fog, like when other people like burning, searing pain and like literally saying bye to somebody on the way I can hold forever. And so when I go to the ER, I tell people um, when the nurse says, what's, what's a pain scale? And I go, I'm a chronic pain condition person. I want you to tell me what pain number you would give to a dislocated pelvis during birth. Most nurses go, well, that's a 15. And I go, I didn't ask for pain medication when that happened to me. This is better, worse, different. And I've stunned a few nurses when they're like, yeah, because people in chronic pain get happier because that's what they're doing to get themselves, you know, the, 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 to go on with the next thing. And then they start to get quieter. So people actually are like, when I'm complaining about things, I'm fine. When I stop complaining, I get quieter and quieter. And then when I go silent, that's like coming up to 10 and then it goes to whimpering past 10. And then it goes to, yeah, it goes to like burning, searing, full car crash. And that's really, I finally felt believed. There was an article that said, this is the same as being in a car crash. And you have, like, for patients, it was at doctors going, like, you have to treat patients properly because it's like we're bringing in a motor vehicle accident, high-speed motor vehicle. You just, you start treating pain. You start pushing. It's everywhere. It's in every muscle. It's in every fiber. Where's the pain? Stupid question. It's literally in the glue of my body. It's in every single little bit. And then, yeah, you do that with emotional pain. You do that with like brain pain or like fawning for people that you're like, oh, it's fine. You're fine. And then you do it with a teacher and you go, I can't talk to them. 
that's my that's my kid masking at school face like by grade three or four when kids have to go like neurodiverse and body diverse kids to the teacher yeah no so i believe people i believe it's that hard so wash the dishes twice wash them any different way wash them with water soak them all don't soak them all uh, learn to dry things out and, and scrub them off. I really do recommend scrubby things. They're great. Just buy good products, but what you can afford, you know, um, but buy one of the good one, do it in your bathtub, uh, do it in a rubber tub or get another big bucket on the side. So you can have a two sink or a three sink where you can like, do it like the camp thing. Why can't you do that at home? Why can't you have a bucket that you wash with? Why can't you use, a big long scrubber. Why can't you use an, like a motor? Go to the like automotive scrubber. Go and buy the stuff, right? Like buy a big, like rather than just like a regular dish sponge, go to the, go to Canadian Tire, um, go to Target, go to wherever you are and just like buy like, I'm going to get the, like a big scrubby, like commercial thing. <laughs> I'm going to, not going to put my hands in the water. I'm going to scrub them out here. Buy one of those stupid things from TikTok that like like grabs your plate and like brushes it around. Apparently some of them don't suck, uh, right? Find the thing that works for you. And when you're cleaning up a room, the thing that worked for this kid was earphones on because he really can hear everything. There was no talking about what he was doing. All they did beforehand was made a plan. They made a plan on grid paper of his room and they drew it out kind of like a square and they went what square are you going to work on like it was an archaeological dig so i drew an approximate line and he loved it he's like let's draw my room like a floor plan and so we drew a room we just kind of went like what does a room look what does your room look like okay is it a square is it a square yeah but it's got like this cutty off the corner thing like in the thing so i'm like okay like this kind of like the door and then you know you your door goes out here or whatever he's like no the door goes the other way and stuff like that so we're figuring it out and i'm like oh, okay where's your bed and he helped me draw it and then we redrew it kind of nicer for him you know like and whatever on a square you know so he could figure it out and then i said well why don't we start with one square like an archaeological dig figure out just that square just clean that square don't clean anything else. I'm supposed to clean my whole room. Archaeologists have to clean one square. They do, they do it all. They're just, they're just starting with one square. And I, thinking my way, suggested, well, why don't we do the one by your bed? Do you like that? Do you like to be able to like step down and have things clean by your bed? But I asked it as a question. And he went, no, nah, the thing that's really annoying is my door. okay because i don't why am i as the adult invested in which square he does first oh that's what parents need to ask themselves that is what people who used to be the kid needs to ask themselves that need you know how many times are you being parented about something bookshelf bookshelf too big one pretty square if you can do a whole bookshelf cool and what do you do while you were doing that archaeological dig? He's like, well, I'm like, so what part of it wears you out? And he's like, well, then I have to put everything around and then I start doing other stuff. I'm like, no, nope, 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 nope. So we actually did what worked for him and there's other ones, but I love, there was a TLC channel before TLC was garbage. Now it is just hot flaming Cheetos garbage, isn't it? used to be a learning channel when my kid when i was pregnant with my first kid it was like clean sweep and trading spaces like fun things for people to learn stuff clean sweep i gotta admit is one of the best shows that ever existed and it has the idea of the um garbage and recycle and or get rid of or whatever and that became like the con, you know, Marie Kondo made it more. I'm like, that's too much. That's too much. Not neurodiverse friendly. And then there's like, and I'm like, okay. So, but yeah, start with three bags or boxes or whatever, or even smaller, a designated doesn't go here. 
And if you are somebody, if your neurodiversity lends yourself to piling too much, or you put it in a box and then forget the box, or if it's in too much of a space, then get a tray. Like literally go to the dollar store and buy like the tray you put watermelon on for little things. And if three boxes is too much, just go to two boxes. He just went to garbage goes somewhere else. And then we shortened it. He actually went with out and in. He literally, and mom was like, I will figure out things that go somewhere else, kid. And so he literally, he didn't even use a box. He was 10 or whatever. And he just threw them out the door into the hallway. Or he put them in a little pile. And his little pile, he did not have a problem visualizing items. Uh, and he knew where they were and he'd remember them. So he could have a pile of something. I can do that too. I have the neurodiversity where I can do, uh, say, you know, oh, I don't have one. Cleaned it out. Oh, something like this. Like if I shove more than one kind of thing in here, I'm fine because I can remember what's in it. You know, like if I'm like, oh, I'm going to collect my earrings and here's a hair tie. And like, oh, that doesn't go here. I'm okay because I'll remember everything I put in there. I don't have the classic um, the other way, but I get it completely because of the way it works for me. I can get that. Like if you put that in there and now it's just like, oh my God, now I can't clean that. It's just going to lie around forever. But then, then do it a different way. Lay it all out or don't do that. What they decided on, because mom finally started to pick it up. Mom was a sweet mom, just didn't know what to do, right? Like just didn't have an idea, I was stuck. And that's okay, right? It, it's okay to be stuck. And that's what mom did to their credit. Mom went, oh, didn't know this. Let's come up with a new thing and started to plan differently with the kid. And that is a whole thing I want to introduce on my channel. I actually want to talk about kids do well when they can, people do well when they can, neurodiverse people do when they do well when they can. And I want to talk about uh, proactive solutions, digging, calm conversations and all that kind of stuff. A lot of stuff that I've learned about changing language. But I wanted to start with this little idea of like, look, hi, Nicole, Nicole, what are we talking about? You just joined. Hello. Um, we are talking about cleaning rooms. Uh, we were talking on the replay crew, you can talk. We were talking mostly about um, dishes and sensory processing stuff. And then on uh, the beginning of that, the ch first chunk is talking about language change and changing it from what other people describe attention deficit disorder to attention regulation discomfort. Those are our three kind of chapters. You know, um, so we are doing this kid. This is the kid's room. And he had a hard time cleaning his room. So we put a map of his room on grid paper and made it into an archaeological dig for dinosaurs. Dinosaurs was not his absolute special interest. That was Pokemon. He was the kid, autistic kid, identified that way. Um, and whenever I talk about kids, I only share what they have gotten consent for and I use their language you know like the person or the family's language so if they're you know if they want autistic versus where they want someone who has autism or whatever I tend to go with what they say but here's their room and I as an adult kind of said oh yeah do near your bed right like so it's easier to get in and out of bed and he's like no it's the door that's hard to open and close I don't like that so don't invest in it as the adult. Just go, okay, start somewhere. It's an archaeological dig. Pick a square. <laughs> you can pick the middle. And do your dishes twice was the idea of anything worth doing is worth doing badly. Badly. So we were working on the same thing with the bookshelf. Don't run around. It is the number one thing that people with neurodiversities Hi, Nicole, and I'm glad that you're happy to say that you were diagnosed with ADHD. Nobody here has to say they can say, because sometimes it's awesome to get to say. And sometimes it feels like doxing yourself and you don't want to put it up. You do you, okay? Um, but cool, you know, oh, why do so many people have ADHD now? Like, it wasn't a thing when I was young. Yeah, because it wasn't a diagnosis when you were young. Neither was tetanus. It used to be called the vapors. 
Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. I sound like one of, there's a makeup guy who does that. I'm totally channeling him. I'm going to have to put a shout out to him. By the way, I'm also putting a shout out to L. Culberson. Music is uh, private, but it is used with permission, Creative Commons. And so is my little logo, Little Misdiagnosed, done like the books. Is uh, There'll be a link up for, uh, what is it? I can't remember his name. He's, he's a, oh my gosh, I can't remember his name. But I'm going to have a link for the, he's actually a, like a, uh, tea turtle type graphic artist kind of thing like you know one of those that sites he does it for you know graphic artists to put onto things um so i actually reached out and got him to to check on that and so yeah we were talking about the classic autism block of not being able to uh not being able to um break apart cleaning because you got to do it the way other people do it and my goal on this channel is to like talk about things from the, the way that it's internal to the person and we have pre-k pause i was thinking um i was thinking the sephora guy the guy that does like what it's like to work at sephora i was so doing that that i was totally doing the like yeah like mac channel thing i don't know i'm gonna have to put it on there but yeah i do channel people i am going to try and not be a jerk about that because I know that in some of the lives um, that I have joined in community wise, there's things like black sense and stuff like that, right? Like the channeling somebody else's language and like appropriating it. Just know I'm trying to make funny faces. And you know what, if I screw up, I will say I made a mistake, but we were trying to do things badly here. So wash your dishes, run the dishwasher twice or buy an automotive scrub brush or a wetsuit. If you need to buy wetsuit gloves for handling sea anemones, because you can get them, you can get the like big neoprene gloves, get them. It's really happening to you. <laughs> and the classic um, not being able to clean something up because you run around ADHD in, in its dominant presentation, a lot of people uh, find that they want to see everything at once. Whereas I'm the reverse. I pile everything because I can remember the pile. So I tend to that way. But I'll have to know, you'll, you, Nicole, you'll have to put what the pre-K pause. I don't remember what, which channel that is. We'll have to find it. But thanks for, <laughs> thanks for hanging. <laughs> but yeah, we picked a square and it was the square at his door. And then he literally just threw things out the door that went out and he put a little pile of in like stays in the room. And he was a kid who didn't struggle with it being on a flat thing or like, and some people get stuck, right? They clean up, they have all that stuff in a little box and then that box just lives there and dies. And so for him, um, he actually wasn't bad at that but he was a little kid, he was like 10 or something. So we got him to his mom at that point said, and she was in like, she just didn't know what to do. She just didn't have new words. And to her credit, she was just fantastic. She's like, yeah, let's do this. What can I do? Oh, okay. And she said, oh, once we get that little pile of things that are in, I don't mind helping you put them around your room and getting that step done. And so if you're doing a bookshelf, find, and if you tend more to the, if I put it in a basket, it'll just stay in the basket. I leave my door cabinets open because I want to see them in the kitchen. If you tend that way, then one dollar store watermelon trays it's when it's like the flat big flat ones you can store them anywhere you can throw them away they tend to be a buck or two right get those and use them as trays to say this is going somewhere else or this stays in this is garbage out and for instance i do i can deal with mixed recycling and garbage for instance i just have the leaves this room and i get like big clear bags and i just their garbage and recycling and then I can pull things out like dry garbage and stuff right like things from around your room that are like this is throw out but not like gross garbage right um and then I just keep I don't run around putting away any of those things because that's where I'll get exhausted mentally or physically for me it's physically mostly but I will do that thing where I'm like oh well this this goes upstairs so I gotta put it upstairs I'm like no it goes on the stairs or no it goes in the basket that goes upstairs and then I ask for help on the stairs so it doesn't just stay on the stairs uh i moved in with a person 
to a huge space doing the minimalist thing in order to avoid doom boxes. That's what they're called, doom boxes and hoarding tendencies. Hoarding tendencies. I had the, I, I have a person in my life um, who previously a housemate that uh, had doom boxes and hoarding tendencies, but not from ADHD, from an, another thing. And we were, I was saying at the beginning, I'm not going to diagnose you're not going to diagnose. If you got a diagnosis and you love it, share it and yell it out loud because you can go, you know, when someone says you're not cool, the best response is you're totally right. I'm not cool. And so if your diagnosis is like, no, I finally have words. Thank you very much. You know, um, but it, it's a different, it's a keeping instinct and that's a traumatic thing. And that's a, 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 a it can be trauma or it can just be a loop right? It can be a thought process. Like I, I can't, I need to something, right? And it's really happening and we have to take it on and we can't just be mean at it. At the same time, the person, you got to talk about it, right? You got to talk and find change. And I'm hoping to uh, talk later on my channel about like drilling down, it's called, uh, which means like talking and questioning without digging into somebody, you know, like just um, like a news reporter, going, well, what about this? Tell me more, right? Calm conversations and kind conversations. Um, I'm hoping to get into that language stuff a lot, but we're just starting with one of my favorite topics, which is the anything worth doing is worth doing badly or differently or weirdly, or, I mean, use your campground skills. If you wash things better with three buckets, because that's what you, you know, those buckets that are the campground buckets, do it, just do it, go for it. So take one square, do one bookshelf and don't run around. Like don't put the stuff back. Or alternately, if you're the person where you go, I'm going to put this one thing back. That's it. I'm not going to clean my whole desk. No. I don't wanna, I'm gonna put this back. Or alternately, one that was my journey of, of I'm not gonna say minimalism, I'm gonna say essentialism. <laughs> I did get rid of about half of the stuff in my life after I went through uh, traumatic, uh, almost a year, really, really bad time in my life. And For me, in or out meant, am I organizing this to keep it because other people in my life and the world and the stress of having it and needing it all? Or am I putting it in my closet because it's useful? And for me, that was the, the, the catching my thought. It's not going to be more useful in my closet. It will be more useful, useful if it leaves. And now I have this thing known as empty drawers. It took me years and mine was just sort of every time I clean, I look at things and I go, do you leave? Do I need you? Could you go to somebody else? Do I give you away? If I want to sell you, is it really worth selling you? Or should I just give you to a secondhand store and then somebody else can find an incredible deal? What am I losing? What's the pain? What's the thing that's going on? What's the discomfort there? And I literally got rid of about half of my stuff. I got, there's an empty drawer back here. It's weird. <laughs> now I'm lucky to have a partner now that, that is actually a minimalist, like creepily. So like, where's all your stuff? Um, and he does the same thing. He just kind of literally goes through a door and he goes, I don't really use this. And now it's easy to maintain. Right. But, Oh, you, I was a maximalist of the highest order. When my, when a person I knew, when I, someone met me back in like 2000 or so, when I was having babies and stuff, when I met another mom, they're like, oh, do, I need to go get a stapler. I'm like, take one of mine. I have three. Cause I really did. Like I was totally, and, and I know why I did it. I had three kids in diapers at once. I had everything. Can I, can I pin that? That, that's, that's awesome. This, this can, that's my channel. Right there. That's why I'm doing this. I've been, I've been workshopping for years. I have been in private practice for years. I have been uh, a professor for years. I've been a teacher for years. I've been blah, blah, blah. 
I'm just going to put it back up there. <laughs> Same comment. Language. What language precedes the change? And the thing that got me streaming was small communities of people who were taking back things from mean girls and how those who are assigned female or present female or uh, identify as women can go like, yeah, I'm not cool. I'm such a nerd. Yeah, but I'm loud and old. I'm loud, old, and fat. And that means you got to go through me. <laughs> and some of you, I, I at Prides this summer, I would never want to, I didn't want to, I went and was a mom, uh, gave up free mom hugs at Pride events. And uh, if we get, if I get comments on my stream or on my Facebook or my Instagram, whenever I've got, when someone puts something transphobic or something like that, I always post, thank you so much for your comment for the algorithm. And then most of them don't notice that what I say next is, you know, your homophobia has helped support my views. And, you know, you're, you're wrong, but thanks for putting it here. I'm going to take it away now so other people don't get hurt by it. You know, and I, and I don't, want to ever I don't want to be the gatekeeper but I'm going to be the bouncer yeah I'm going to keep things safe for myself and for others and language is kind of the you know the thing I like pretty organization like rainbow things but I also like gothic decor well black's a color well it's technically a shade oh my god I'm a so I, I'm I'm a a young woman and an old man stuck together I think that's why I speak like I do well actually did you know how the mansplainer got hurt joke time I should have like a thing that pops up bad joke time alert 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 dad joke time did you know how the mansplainer got injured he fell down a well actually Thanks, Dad. Rainbow pens? I don't know. <laughs> I, I, may, I may have gotten a master's in linguistics and language of design and design of language. Just, it, it, no, it has nothing to do with rainbow stuff. Nothing, no, no. I wouldn't live in a Staples if I could. I would not just go to an Office Depot and stay there forever. No, yeah, good phrase. Absolutely good phrase. Like, but do those things. Know thyself. Catch the things that are protective features, coping strategies that are no longer protecting you. Uh, when your fences become walls. Oh, yeah. Where does he get his water? But I like the injured one better, especially if I'm feeling like he deserves it. Depends on the mansplainer, I guess. Because sometimes, you know, I, I have a lot of neurodiverse mansplainers in my family that are going, well, actually, because they've got good information. And then there's mansplainers who are literally leaning forward and being a... So, you know, depends. I like that he fell down well. <laughs> or what sound do you hear when a piano falls down a mine shaft? A flat minor. Thanks, Dad. Um, I my I remember my dad through his bad jokes and all the other ones out there. So <laughs> put, I should put a trigger warning: dad jokes and talk of abuse, seriously and not seriously, <laughs> right? Um, so start with language, and I hope that. Some of you can carry whether you're, you're live. It's nice to have a few people here. And I knew that it'd be sort of a startup. I said that I was like, I have so many people that I've talked to privately. And I'm like, you know what? I don't care if I'm going to have like one or two people here for years. I don't care because it makes me record. And then people can like watch it whenever. Even if it's here 10 years later, I don't care. You know, um, this is a completely non, it was nice to be non-monetary. I'm now working full time. And I'm glad to share my privilege and not have to hustle. Um, so it's nice to be able to just be like, I just want to talk to people. But let's record it and put it out there because I've been spending so much time going, I talk so much. I should have it for posterity. <laughs> so a ton of mansplayers. Okay, trying to tell me how to play the game. My favorite, look it up. 
the worst mansplaining one was the guy who explained something about space to an astronaut with a physics PhD. Uh, that... That's not well, actually. That's, that's, oh, yeah. <sighs> Want to hear a joke? <laughs> Fell down a well. There's nothing wrong with the autistic. A lot of autistic people use the well actually though, or the actually to start sentences. So I give people the benefit of the doubt for the first little bit. Are they trying to break into a conversation? It's not the phrase well actually that bugs me. It's whether or not you're a <laughs> with what you say, you know? Um, and that's, that's a good way to end actually. I think I gotta go eat dinner, but it's a good way to go. Intent matters. Intention doesn't always matter when it hurts me, but let's start to break it apart into two pieces. What my emotional brain says and what my thoughts come up and catch that thought, but I got to do the dishes. Yeah, but I could, is there anything really wrong with using one dish like you're at the campground for a while? If the weekend means you just keep reusing the same bowl, it's okay. If you go to the automotive thing, or you do them twice, you wash them again. You wash them once badly, and then you're like, no, it wasn't good enough. I'm going to wash another plate. I'm going to wash that plate again. Or you're going to um, put them in the sink. You're going to put them in the thing. You're going to do, you're going to do them, run the dishwasher again if you got a dishwasher, if you're privileged enough to have one of those. You know, like do, just do the thing and start to break it apart going, I can do this any way that it gets done. And do one bookshelf. And find a way to do the bookshelf. Get out a tray and go, these things don't go in this bookshelf, or these are or maybe just, these are the things that I'll leave. I'm gonna leave everything on the bookshelf except everything I wanna give away. And then you're not like taking the whole project away. And you're not like, oh my God, now there's bookshelf on my floor. You could be like, I am not gonna touch the bookshelf. I'm just gonna go buy it and go, everything that I don't care about, that can leave. It's imperfect, but I did enough. And then break it down differently. And I will be back on a different day, probably Tuesday, Thursdays, and the weekend one day, um, depending on my health, to, uh, to talk about, we're going to do a lot of language, but I'm going to, we'll come up with clickbait. But thank you for hanging out with me. Thank you for anybody who's watching this a day later, a week later, a year later, or a decade later, because that's still less time then I was misdiagnosed for 30 years. So if anybody makes it wherever they're going a little faster, I'm happy to walk alongside for a little while. <laughs> I'm gonna head out, talk to y'all later.